Dear people of God, we have embarked on the series, We Long for the Greater Day. And in the series, throughout the season of Lent, we are looking at aspects of our lament collectively as a congregation, collectively in public worship, perhaps also individually as well. As we recognize some of the aspects of our world and our life that are not what they ought to be. And if you're a guest here this morning, just to kind of catch you up to where we've been. We've looked at aspects of the prevalence of sin the power of sin in the world around us and the way that it impacts on our lives and is damaging to us in our relationships with God and with others as we live the life that God calls us to live. We've recognized the power of evil against the kingdom of God. The spirits of evil, the forces of evil that line up against the kingdom of God. And this morning we continue that as we become very specific and we lament the unjust suffering of many Christians. Jesus said to his followers, you will be hated by everyone because of me. Strong language, you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We recognize, of course, that had an immediate application to the followers of Jesus Christ, to his disciples, as Jesus went through that time of suffering and opposition and then the crucifixion. And there was persecution afterwards that broke out against the church. These words of Jesus still have a powerful warning and in some sense an encouragement as well implicit for all of the body of Christ, for believers around the world and for us as we worship our God here in Chatham. We're going to follow some of the implications of this prediction that Jesus has and seek God's guidance and strength as followers of Jesus Christ. You will be hated by everyone because of me. There's suffering for the sake of following Jesus. And we're not immune to that suffering. Perhaps, having heard the stories of suffering, to, to some extent we may become somewhat insensitive. Perhaps we've become too used to some of the stories. And perhaps they don't shake us the way that they ought to. Some of the stories are graphic. And you've heard about some of them. There are illustrations from other countries around the world. And I don't want to use shock treatment this morning. And yet, we may not forget and we may not close our hearts and our minds to the reality of the suffering of others in the world around us. I won't be too vivid, but remember the ISIS video from Libya just last month. 21 Coptic Christians from Egypt led out onto the beach, and there they lost their life because they were Christians. There are stories of suffering from around the world. In fact, there is unprecedented opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world today. Last month, five Christians were jailed in Laos. What was their crime? Well, you see, there was a woman who was ill. And five Christians gathered together to pray for her. 
she died. The five Christians were arrested and charged with attempting to heal without an official medical license. And they were jailed for nine months, sentenced to nine months in jail for alleging to be healers. Kind of mind-boggling for us living in Canada. There are stories from around the world. Last, or in, in January, World Renew reported that in Niger, a country in which the 90-some percent Muslim community historically has lived in, in close relationship with the minority Christian population and it's been basically peaceful and, and so on historically. Well, in January, widespread violence broke out. It was burning of property, looting, and considerable loss of Christian life as the Muslim population was instigated to violence against the Christians. Illustrations from all around the world. In fact, a voice of the martyrs uh, has a map and the colors here perhaps not as, as vibrant as we might like to see, but if you look at brown, this whole brown belt, those are all areas in which there is serious hostility and opposition to the Christians living in those countries. There is actually in each of these countries official opposition to the open outward expression of the Christian faith and to worship. It's a huge part of the global map. And in these pockets of red, in the red countries that are here, well, official government policy is to protect Christians and to allow for Christians, but the reality in everyday life is that in various areas and region, there is such opposition and hostility to the Christian faith that Christians there are endangered with loss of life and loss of property and loss of freedom. And then in addition, there are a number of spots on this map that are green. And those are areas that are being monitored by Voice of the Martyrs as they recognize an increasing trend of opposition to the Christian population. So if we look at that map and we see that expanse, that extent of either outright official government opposition and reprisals to more regional and localized suffering of Christians to areas where there are warning signs and escalating violence and opposition. It's a major part of the globe. So we see that around the world there is tremendous unjust suffering of Christians. And then we may think that this suffering for the sake of following Jesus is something that happens out there and in other places in the world and we might be thankful that we live where we do but brothers and sisters in Christ we need to realize the changing climate even of our own country and our own continent. There are illustrations of intolerance of Christianity in Canada. And the climate of respect or disrespect for Christianity is changing rapidly. It's changing by the decade in North America. So a recent article that was shared with me by a member of our congregation comes from Julius de Jager, who's associated with the Ontario Alliance of Christian Schools, and he summarizes the change of secular attitude 
within North America. And he gives numerous examples of how Christianity, which previously was respected and then was, well, kind of indifferently tolerated in this day and age, is becoming increasingly less tolerated in various circles. He gives examples of Trinity Western University and their degree granting program and the reality that they were uh, permitted as a university to grant degrees even while having a, a covenant of morality for their students. Certain expectations that they uh, placed upon their students to agree with certain moral conduct and standards. And then their law program was granted legal status and is currently being challenged by law societies of other provinces across the country on the grounds that Trinity Western University shouldn't be allowed to grant legal degrees if they have certain moral expectations from their students. In fact, it's a deep, powerful opposition to Christian education and open public Christian principles in our country. Julius de Jager concludes religion, this is the attitude today amongst many leaders in our country, religion needs to be powerless and quiet. If a religious leader speaks out in the public square, he will be challenged and scorned. Religious ideas really need to stay in a small box, preferably shoved into a corner. What has happened over the last decades in North America? Many of us can remember when religious leaders, in general, were held in respect, were honored, were appreciated for their contribution to society. And then gradually that respect and that honor seems to have started to, to wane and to drift away. Religion was tolerated. And we're rapidly getting to the point in our North American culture today and in Canada today where one example after the other proves that there is an increasing intolerance of the Christian religion. Julius de Jager summarizes that in the field of education and in certain realms of politics. The reality is our country, our community, our context is becoming increasingly intolerant of open public Christianity. Christianity is, is to be kept quiet, is to be kept private, and is to be kept is to be kept on such a common denominator level that it's basically just some human principles that all can agree on. And anything more than that, anything more strongly biblical, anything more outspoken, is becoming less tolerated in our culture. It's a situation in which we live, and, and what's our response to that? What's our response to the global situation the hundreds of thousands of Christians who are persecuted and martyred. What's our response to the global increasing intolerance of Christianity? Well, we lament the unjust suffering of Christians. And we may go to our, our Father and we may be heartbroken. In fact, we ought to be when we recognize what's happening around the world. We don't live in an isolated bubble. We don't live in a shell that will protect us. 
we need to recognize the insidious evil that persecutes and kills Christians. We lament it. And we need to take time in our worship and time in our day to come into the presence of our God and to pray from the depth of our heart that God will reverse these trends in the world. Christians also learn to respond with a a certain sense of joy and peace while suffering for the sake of the gospel. Strange as that may sound, there's a pattern that goes back to the time of Christ and the early Christian church. Jesus reminded his followers that they would be hated. They would be hated if they were transparent about their love for Christ. It wasn't long and that prediction came true. The book of Acts describes how the early church was immediately persecuted and hatred was leveled at the disciples. The disciples heard the wisdom of Jesus and at times they fled looking for safety. And they spread the gospel to different places in fleeing to other towns. But there were times when they couldn't escape. And and this is the remarkable thing. Jesus had said to them, don't worry about what you have to say because it'll be the Spirit speaking through you. And when they experienced that, for them it was remarkable and it was life-changing and it was empowering. They realized it wasn't just about them, it was about the gospel and and God didn't abandon them and God didn't leave them in their suffering but he sent them his Holy Spirit and he empowered them in a special way and they were able to respond to charges that were leveled against them with the wisdom that God gave them through the Holy Spirit. And remarkably, they experienced joy in it. And the disciples summarized their joy in this way. They considered it a privilege to have solidarity with Jesus Christ in his suffering. Remembered that Jesus didn't deny his own followers. Jesus never failed them. Jesus never abandoned them. Jesus was willing to pay the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice, giving up his perfect life for imperfect sinners. And the disciples in return found an incredible, powerful inner peace when they were allowed in return to suffer for Jesus. The remarkable story that comes to us throughout the ages, throughout the history, is that the church grows in times of opposition and suffering. And individuals grow through suffering for Christ. In fact, there there are stories, and this is remarkable, but there are stories of those who were kidnapped and held hostage because of the Christian faith. They were imprisoned. They were beaten and subjected to horrendous torture. They prayed from the depth of their heart that they could be freed from that suffering, that they could rejoin their families, that they could rejoin other believers. God answered their prayer. And afterwards, perhaps strangely and oddly enough, when they got together, they said, you know, we miss something of our suffering in prison. Because God was never closer. His touch was never more tender. His love was never more real. His presence never more powerful than when we were suffering for the sake of the gospel. Christians learn that there's a a, a tremendous peace, there's a tremendous power of God that's demonstrated in their life. 
when they're called to suffer for Jesus' sake. And they open themselves up and say, in our, in our own power, we can't hold on. We would renounce the faith if it was up to us, but fill us with your Holy Spirit in such a way that we know you'll never let go of us and we can't let go of you. Christians, in those times of opposition, in those times of challenge, recognize the sincerity of their faith. It's not just tradition. It's not just convenience Christianity. It's not just looking for God's instant reward. It's the reality of who they are in Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we also learn to find joy and peace while suffering for the sake of the gospel. And there are a number of Bible texts, and I'd like to just lead us through a number of these texts in, in fairly quick succession as we continue to grow in that, as we develop a, a full biblical perspective on Christian suffering. What, what are some of these Bible texts? 2 Corinthians 1 verse 7 says, And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the one who has detailed uh, elsewhere in another chapter how often he was beaten, how often he was stoned, how often he was imprisoned, how often he was persecuted for the sake of the gospel. And he gives expression to the hope that, that nobody can beat out of him. And the hope that's being shared with other congregations as they too stand firm in that faith amid suffering. They share the suffering and they share the hope. They share the pain and they share the glory of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Paul saying, this is what God has given to you. He's given you the faith. He's given you the experience of suffering. And you put those two together. And you come up with a, a life of peace in the presence of God. How could they have that peace? They had they had the bigger picture. Paul says, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. And it works the other way around too. When we're strong, when we think we're strong, when we think we're secure, we're actually at our weakest. You know, sometimes we look back at what's happening to the church in Canada. We see people drifting away. We look back and sometimes we're tempted to have some nostalgia and we're, we're tempted to say, uh, remember when the churches were full, the pews were overflowing, the numbers were coming, the church was strong. And what happens in times like that? Often people are tempted to think life is good. We don't need God. Life is secure. We don't need extra protection. You know how hard it is to pray for your daily bread when the cupboards are full and there's lots of money in the bank. It's true also when it comes to suffering for the sake of the gospel, when everything seems secure, when, when life seems to be easy. The prayer for God's protection doesn't seem to be so urgent. The Apostle Paul realizes that in his own life and he recognizes that it's, it's his vulnerability. It's when he doesn't know whether he'll survive the day or end up the next day in prison. It's in times of hardship that his prayer life is the most powerful. His faith is being tested and he recognizes the joy of having a tested faith 
that can stand and endure. Hebrews has a number of passages that give us a very powerful, powerful summary of our Christian perspective on suffering. It talks about Joseph. Joseph, who as a man of faith, chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. What a powerful testimony to that person. If there's one thing that we would desire to have said in a eulogy at our funeral. Could you think of one thing that would be more powerful than this? He or she chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. That's a tribute to a character that's shaped by the power of God. Hebrews 10, 32 to 39, gives us a, a lectionary, really, on suffering. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light. Hebrews is talking about the early Christian community. After you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. They, they had that perspective that you can take away the, the riches of this world, but how does that compare to the wealth of eternal life? This is temporary. That's forever. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. That's a prediction of the return of Jesus Christ. It's saying, uh, people, don't, don't let go of your faith. Don't bail now. Don't quit. Jesus is coming. He's returning. And but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. God, God is saying, I'm delighted in those who remain faithful, but not pleased with those who, who quit, who, who leave the faith. And then that final encouragement, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. That voice has been heard all through the, the history of the Christian church. Don't quit now. Don't stop because times are tough. And don't quit because life is easy. Hold on to your faith. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. It's part of our Christian calling to show solidarity with others nearby and far away who are suffering for the sake of the gospel. It's part of our, our Christian formation. It's part of the expression of our Christian faith that we unselfishly pray for and show solidarity with those who suffer for the sake of Christ. People of God, we have this concluding encouragement this morning from 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Those are the choices that God gives us in his word. Endure and reign with Christ in glory forever or disown Christ and be disowned. So what's, what's your perspective on suffering in the world? 
Are you faithfully remembering our sisters and brothers in Christ around the world who suffer for the sake of Christ? Do you in spirit suffer with them? Praying for them. Pleading for the maintaining of their faith. And do you recognize the challenges to the faith in the world around us? The growing opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the uncertainty of the age in which we live, the reality that intolerance may continue to grow and we don't know what this world will look like a decade or two from today. Are you praying? Are you building a strong foundation for yourself, your family, your children, and your grandchildren? Are you building that strong foundation so that in times of opposition, uh, we're not caught off guard and we don't panic, but we realize that this too is how God tests and strengthens the faith of his followers. Do you lament the suffering, the unjust suffering of Christians? while at the same time finding reason to rejoice that suffering brings solidarity with Christ and strengthens our faith and demonstrates the reality of our relationship with God and the preciousness of that relationship. Have you made that personal commitment to do what it takes in your life? Come what may, to endure with Christ so that we may reign with him. That's the glorious calling that we have in Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, this is your world. You have created it. You own it. And in Jesus Christ, you have bought it back. Father, you must be grieved at what you see happening in this world. You must be grieved at what you see happening to your children and to the church. Father, you must also be grieved at times in seeing what's happening within the church. Father, we pray that you will shape our faith. Give us strength to endure times of suffering and opposition. Give us a mindset in which we realize we don't have the right to escape opposition. Give us the determination that when we are called to suffer for Jesus' sake, we will seek to remain faithful and true. We pray for our sisters and brothers around the world who are persecuted. Father, we thank you that even in the midst of suffering, they can rejoice in Christ. Father, we pray that you will will strengthen us each day to live joyfully as followers of Jesus Christ. As we lament the wrong, but know that we have a risen Savior and live for that greater day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.